to that Old Testament prophet. That's where we'll be spending our time today. Isaiah chapter 5, to be specific. I find that a lot of times when we are looking at the Old Testament uh, prophets, uh, that we spend time talking about uh, things that are relevant to uh, Christianity. Especially in Isaiah, most of the time we'll go to things that uh, point towards Jesus. We'll go to things that uh, show God's glory and maybe relate to uh, imagery of how he might appear when he's in his glory and radiance in heaven. But one of the important things about uh, books like this is that uh, God always sent his prophets when he had a message for his people. And a lot of the times that message was born. It was one where people uh, needed to hear a message and God needed to correct them. Uh, you might even say that that work culminated in Jesus and the apostles because they were sort of the last prophets to come up and to say, this is the way God wants you to behave. These are the things that you need to do to uh, change your ways and to uh, follow God. And that's sort of the legacy of the scriptures that we have received. So in the same way, when we reflect on the Old Testament prophets, we're looking for the way God was teaching his people how to behave. Uh, that might actually just kind of sound like trite to say, right? That we, well, of course, that's what the scripture is for, is to tell you how to behave. That's, that's what the Bible is, is for. But... I think in saying that, we might be reducing it to um, a, a point where we're not really getting the fullness of what God was doing. It's not merely instructions, um, it's also a, a way for us to relate to who God is, what his, his character is, what quality of person he has, uh, in addition to just hearing from him as a deity, instructing us mere mortals how to behave. And so let's listen a little bit to what Isaiah had to say in his prophecy in chapter 5. Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved, beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the middle of it, and he hewed out of that wine vat in it. And he expected it to produce good grapes, but it only produced worthless ones. Now, O the inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than what I have not done in it? That I have not done in it. Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now, let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of the hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah is delightful land. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness. You see, God didn't pick a bad spot to plant. He didn't pick bad vines to plant. He didn't treat it poorly by not building a wall or by not keeping an eye on it and keeping animals out of it. He didn't treat it poorly by not tending it and making sure that it was well watered. Everything that was supposed to be there for a good vineyard was provided, and yet the fruit so the result of that bad fruit was that the wall was pushed over, the hedge was torn up, and everything and anything that wants to run through there was going to trample it to the, and it was going to turn into wasted ground. There wasn't going to be any vineyard anymore. The vines would remain and the ruin of a wall, but the fruit was not worth the picking and the uh, work done to tend it was not worth doing. What can be done for this vineyard? Or what more was there to, uh, that was not done for it? It says in verse 4. Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce 
produce worthless ones. God works on us. He works on his people. He puts in time and effort. He puts us in a good place to grow. He planted good vines. But when those vines don't produce, there's no reason to keep tending them. And that's what he was saying to the people of Judah at this time. When God was reflecting on the work that the people had done, they had only produced bad fruit. And so there was no sense in tending any more. There was no vineyard if there were no good grapes. If God has tended us and pruned us and kept us well, and he desires good fruit from us, looks for our health and growth, but when his vineyard does not produce, how can we expect anything less than to be abandoned, to be turned away from, to be left to fall apart? The vines grew. The dirt was good. There was plenty of water. There was no excuse for not producing fruit. But yet, the fruit was bad. It wasn't that it didn't grow. It wasn't that it wasn't taken care of. It was the bad fruit that God was concerned with. Woe to those who add house to house and join field to field until there is no more room, so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land. In my ears, the Lord of hosts has sworn, surely many houses shall become desolate, even great and fine ones without occupants. For ten acres of vineyard will yield only one bath of wine, and a whole of seed will yield but a half of grain. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they might pursue strong drink, who stay up late in the evening that wine may inflame them. Their banquets are accompanied by lyre and harp, by tambourine and flute and by wine, but they do not pay attention to the deeds of the Lord, nor do they consider the work of his hands. The people that God was concerned with had lacked uh, in no prosperity up to this point, but God was taking that away from them. But they had plenty of opportunity to build houses for themselves, to join their fields together and expand and to make themselves more and more wealthy, they had not seen the results uh, that they wanted because God had turned their back on them, or that all this fruitfulness had been there, now he was going to bring desolation. Therefore, my people will go into exile for their lack of knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude is parched with thirst. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged his throat and opened its mouth without measure, and Jerusalem's splendor, her multitude, and her din of revelation, the jubilant within her, descend into it. So the common man will be humbled, and the man of importance and abased, and the eyes of the proud will be abased. But the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment, and the Holy God himself will show him holy, himself holy. Then the lambs will graze in their pasture, and strangers will eat the waste place. It will eat in the waste places of the wealthy. So he looked at this place where people had enriched themselves, made themselves great, built themselves big houses, and joined multiple pieces of land together to make expansive uh, territories that they could control. And he looked at them and he said, "Okay, I've seen what you've done for yourself." But what have you produced for me? Where's the good fruit? Where's the righteousness that I was expecting? And instead, he said, the grave, death, will open up its throat and enlarge its mouth uh, without measure. And be, everyone within Jerusalem will be swallowed up and will be drawn into that. And that's that imagery is not merely frightening because you're thinking about death itself, the grave opening up its mouth to swallow people, but also because these are the people. These are God's people. These are the ones who are supposed to know better and supposed to be doing what God wants. Church, if we are not producing the fruit God wants, then we can only expect decay and ruin. If we are not reaching out and doing the good that God wants, the grave will open its mouth and swallow us. That is the fruit that God wants us to produce. 
We can enlarge ourselves, enrich ourselves, make our lives better. But if we're not turning that wealth into righteousness, then God himself will have to glorify himself through our punishment, as he did with Judah. Did you notice that in verse 16? It says, The Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment, and the Holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. God said, I was supposed to be glorified by how good you were. You were supposed to be my shining crown of glory by showing how good God's people are. That they're righteous. They conduct themselves according to the law of the Lord. That they are my people because of how they behave and not just where they live. But he said, Jerusalem will become a waste. Israel will be ruined. Judah will be ruined. Because you weren't glorifying me. But I will be glorified. Because I will show how righteous I am by giving judgment even to the people who are supposed to be on my side. Mercy was not going to glorify God here, only judgment. He could only show himself to be righteous through this passage, he says, by bringing this judgment about. By being righteous in the face of their injustice. But, preacher, what were they doing? What was so bad? What was this bad fruit they were making? You can just say that, but we all know what bad things are. What did that bad fruit really look like? Well, lucky for you and me, Isaiah tells us. Verse 18. Woe to those who drag iniquity with the cords of falsehood, and sin as if, as if with cork, cart ropes, who say, Let him make speed, let him hasten his work that we may see it, and let the purpose of the Holy One of Israel draw near, and come to pass that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes of drinking wine and valiant men in strong drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of those who are in the right. There it is. They took what was good and made it evil, and they took what was evil and made it good. If there was somebody that they could justify through their means, they didn't go to save the righteous man, but they paid a bribe to save the wicked. If there was something that could be done to help someone who was good and was in need, they turned to the wicked and helped them instead. And while they were turning sin, while they were turning right, unrighteousness and iniquity into their workhorse, while they were driving themselves forward with their evil doing, they were giving God credit. He says uh, that they were dragging iniquity with the cords of falsehood and saying, let him make speed, let him hasten his work that we may see it. Let the purpose of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come to pass that we may know it. They were giving God credit for the sin they were doing. <coughs> the work that they were trying to accomplish was evil, but they were saying this is what God wants. And then they were surprised when God decided to turn them over to ruin and to reject them. Verse 24, Therefore as a tongue of fire consumes stubble, and dry grass collapses into the flame, so their root will become light and rot, and their blossom blow away as dust. For they rejected the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. On this account, the anger of the Lord has burned against his people. He has stretched out his hand and struck against them and struck them down. And the mountains quaked, and their corpses lay like refuse in the middle of the streets. For all this, his anger is not spent, but his hand is still stretched out. He said, God already finished destroying you. Your bodies are like trash in the middle of the road. Nobody cares about it. You're not even buried properly. You've been so disgraced. But God's not done with you yet. Unfortunately, he's still got his hand stretched out in anger. And what is God going to do now that the people have spent all their time glorifying evil, and rejecting good. What is God going to do now that he's promised them death and destruction like that 
Verse 26, you also lift up a standard to the distant nation, and whistle for it, for it from the ends of the earth. And behold, it will come with speed, swiftly. No one in it is weary or stumbles. No one slumbers or sleeps, nor is the belt on it at its waist undone, nor its sandal strap broken. Its arrows are sharp, and on all its bows are bent. The hooves of its horses will seem like flint, and its chariot feels like a whirlwind. Its soaring is like, roaring is like a lioness, and it roars like young lions. It growls as it seizes the prey and carries it off with no one to deliver it. It will growl over it in that day like the roaring of the sea. If one looks to the land, and behold, there's darkness and distress. Even the light is darkened by its clouds. God was ready to humiliate these people who called evil good and good evil, so much so that he was whistling for an, an enemy nation to come in like an attack dog and take him out. Roar like a lion and see their complete destruction. They're going to move so fast that no one will be able to avoid them. He says they're swift, they're powerful, they're ready to consume these people and drag them out. The next chapter of this book is a description of God's glory. It's a description of God filling the temple and Isaiah seeing it with his own eyes. A lot of times when we come to this book, this is where we go. We want to see God in his glory. We want to see God in his majesty, ready to look down on his enemies and bring a word of power. But sometimes his enemies are his own people. And sometimes that word of power is that they are destined for destruction. It doesn't have to be with us. While God's people at that time had turned their back on him by harming others and thinking nothing, by enlarging their own estate while other people suffered, by uh, looking to their own well-being instead of the glory of God, we don't have to do the same. We are people of repentance. <laughs> In a lot of ways, we're more akin to that distant nation who came when God called than we are the people he was punishing in this chapter. Uh, now, there may be some exceptions in this crowd. I don't know all, all of our lineages and backgrounds, but most of us are Gentiles, not Jewish people. And what that means is we're not the people that God called to himself at that time. Instead, we've been redeemed through a special process that he underwent through Jesus. He sent Jesus to come and call us to him, to save us. It, when God's people will not glorify him, will not do what is right, he calls the nations to do it. And they'll take that spot. They'll fulfill that role. But at the same time, once we have joined to God's people, we have to be producing good fruit or we will be subject to the same wrath and punishment that he was looking forward to giving to these people at this time. They disgraced themselves to the point where he had to be the one to glorify himself. May we never be in that position. If we're not glorifying God, we don't want to have him have to step up and do it himself. Our role as the church is to be doing what is right and calling what is right, right, and what is evil, evil. Make sure that we are making good happen in the world around us. We don't want God to look at us and say, what can be done for this video? And what could, could have been done that I haven't done already? We want to be producing good fruit from the very start. One of the things I think we make a mistake of a lot of times reflecting on scriptures, including the prophets, is that we turn inward. And we look at our own individual lives when we're looking at the scriptures. We'll say, how can I apply this to me? What does this mean to me? Now, I'm not saying that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, in part. But it is just a part. The scriptures, from the very beginning, were written to people. They were written to groups of people. They were written 
to the Israelites first, and then the New Testament scriptures were written to the believers who chose to follow Jesus. And if we're not reading it as a church, we're not reading scripture. We're just reading a self-help book. If you want advice on how to be a good person, go ask Tony Robbins. Go ask somebody else. Plenty of other people can give you wisdom on how to be a good person and live a good life and be successful and get friends and be a happy person. But if you want to know how to be godly, we have to do that together. We have to be producing fruit as a vineyard. Nobody plants a single grapevine and starts a vineyard. You're not going to make enough fruit to make wine to be successful. Even for yourself, you can't take the produce of, a, of one grapevine and make a bottle of wine for yourself. I, I mean, I, maybe somebody can. Ignorance on alcohol production. But my point is that when God is building a vineyard, he's putting a bunch of vines together. He's walling us in and watering us and tending us and making sure that we have everything we need. And our job as the vines in this parable that Isaiah told is to produce good fruit. And if we don't, we'll get pruned, but the rest of the vineyard will stand. The problem is, when all the vines fail to produce, and all the vines get torn down, when the whole vineyard is turned into <coughs> a woman. So our goal, as we reflect on scriptures, is not only to look to our individual lives as Christians, but to look to the whole vineyard, to look to the church, and how can we continue to produce fruit? How can we continue to grow? How can we continue to glorify God? And one of the first things we have to do is make sure that we look at what is good and say it is good, and look at what is evil and say it is evil. I make a habit of avoiding being political in the pulpit, and I'm not going to do that today. But you may find some relevance to our political scene as I say what I'm going to say. There are groups of people who want your allegiance. Now, whether that's a political party or even an entire country, they will want you to co-sign every single thing they do and say, yes, yes, sir, every time they make a decision. I need you, no matter which direction you lean and who you're more sympathetic to do, to, to say no when they say yes to something Something that you know God rejects. Now you might find that one side or another, one group, one person, may be more favorable or not. But you need to call evil evil and good good, or you're sinning. You need to be, as a church, willing to reject what is wrong and embrace what is right, or God will reject you. We have an opportunity right now in this country to do a lot of good for a lot of people. But if we neglect that opportunity, God will neglect us. I have fear in my heart, not for what God will do to us, but what we'll do to ourselves by our bad decisions. We as a church, as in this world, at this era, are at a crossroads. A very important point no matter who is pulling at your attention, no matter who thinks they deserve your allegiance and your time and your heart, no man gets that but God. No man can take that over the Lord. Produce good fruit. Don't neglect your duty. Don't let them pull you one side or another. Keep going straight ahead. That is the only way we can succeed. If we want God to keep the wall around us as a vineyard, we need to produce good fruit. We need to make sure we're on His side, nobody else's. I hope this lesson has been beneficial for you today. I hope that the words of the prophet have reached you in a way that can 
help you to understand who God is and what He wants us to do. If that's the case, and you haven't been subject to the gospel, we offer now, as we always do, an opportunity to respond to that gospel, to be baptized and to be saved. And we would like to fulfill that at any time, but now is convenient. If you also need prayers to the church or encouragement, or we can do anything for you at all, we'd offer that you take advantage of this opportunity as we stand as a